Let's take a look at imaging techniques and analysis of the spine using medical imaging. Beyond trauma and congenital defects, most of the problems with the spine are age-related pathology. Our bodies change gradually as we age, so let's take a look at the elderly nervous system and what happens as we put years behind us. The brain weight decreases 6 to 7 percent and its size also decreases. The blood flow to the brain declines by 15 to 20 percent and nerve conduction slows up to 15 percent. The central nervous system also is protected by the spine. And as we grow older, there are definite changes in the spine that impact the central nervous system as well. In viewing the elderly musculoskeletal system, osteoporosis develops, especially in females. The spinal disc narrows, resulting in kyphosis. Joints lose flexibility and become more susceptible to repetitive stress injury, while the skeletal muscle mass also decreases. Also, as we age, the spinal cord injury is sometimes due to the size of the spinal canal, which decreases in diameter, leaving less room for movement of the spinal cord. On the other end of the age spectrum, we can have congenital problems, such as spina bifida, spondylolisthesis, spondylolysis, and scoliosis. Scoliosis increases in severity with age, so we measure what is called Cobb's angle to determine when and if to intervene and try to do Harrington rods or some other thing to correct the problem. Here we see some extreme cases of scoliosis and, in some cases, it can even cause death. The curvature of the spine impacts on the lungs and the breathing, and there's no room for any more breathing or movement, so therefore the patient expires. This image demonstrates a child with severe scoliosis, and it's been repaired with Harrington rods going up the spine. This graphic demonstrates the utilization of Harrington rods. So why do we order an imaging study? Well, the purpose is to obtain morphologic information about the spine, and it is part of a diagnostic workup. The four most frequently ordered studies to evaluate spinal disorders are radiographs, MRI, CT, and nuclear medicine examinations. Computed tomography allows us to look at the spinal column in three dimensions. We get cross-sectional images that generate the information that we need to evaluate the spine. Spatial and contrast resolution is dependent on the energy of the x-ray source, the slice thickness, the field of view, and the scanning matrix used. The strength of the CT is its excellent resolution of bone and the elimination of superimposition of other body parts. CT is frequently used in trauma cases to detect fractures and also frequently used preoperatively in evaluation of patients with stenosis or tumors. Radionuclide scans are often limited to situations where screening the entire body is required such as infection or metastatic disease but they can be useful to detect stress fractures. The strength of MRI resides in its excellent soft tissue contrast, direct multiplanar imaging, and the absence of ionizing radiation exposure to the patient. The major contraindication is presence of any electrical device in the body, brain aneurysm clips, or some cochlear or ocular implant device. T1 MRI signals have high or bright signal, and they're good for delineating anatomic structures. Whereas a T2 weighted MRI signal is related to the state of hydration of the tissue. Any tissue rich in free or extracellular water will be very bright. Cerebral spinal fluid, necrotic tissue, fluid collections, and intervertebral discs and neoplasms show up well. Elderly patients with osteoporosis or suspected osteoporosis often get a DEXA scan to measure the density of the tissues of the spine. 
There is very low radiation to the patient and very little scatter to the technologist that is giving the patient the study. Today we can help treat for osteoporosis. When DEXA scanning first came out, all it could do was let you know you had osteoporosis, but we had no treatments. Osteoporosis is common. 44 million Americans have osteoporosis or low mineral bone density. It is a serious condition that causes fractures because of the fragility of the bones. Today, treatments are effective and the fracture risk can be reduced by as much up as 50%. Bone density testing is done for three reasons. To diagnose osteoporosis, to predict fracture risk, and finally to monitor therapy. Indications for bone density testing. First, all women age 65 and older or all men age 70 and older. Adults with fragility fractures, adults with a disease or condition associated with low bone density. Also, adults taking medication associated with low bone density. And for anyone being treated for low bone density to monitor the treatment effect. Let's take a few minutes to review the anatomy of the spine. Prior to looking at the skeletal anatomy, let's look at the central nervous system and specifically the spinal cord, which is protected by the spine. The spinal cord goes through the spinal canal and is protected by the spine. We have 31 pairs of spinal nerves and they are mixed nerves. The nerves are not uniform in diameter and the cervical enlargement supplies the upper limbs, while the lumbar enlargement supplies the lower limbs. And finally, we have the quatrus equini. When we are born, we only have one curve to our spine, sort of a C. In about six months, as the infant starts to lift its head during the first few months, the cervical curve and its muscles develop. At about nine months, as the infant learns to crawl and stand, the lower back or the lumbar curve and its muscles start to develop. This graphic represents the normal spinal curvatures of an adult. And here we see the functionality of the curves that help us in walking, standing, crawling, jumping, and running. An abnormal forward bending of the spine and the thoracic spine is called kyphosis. Kyphosis often happens as we age. And lordosis is an exaggerated lumbar curvature. When we take a look at scoliosis, that is an abnormal lateral curvature. Here we see a combination of kyphosis and scoliosis. Scoliosis being one or more abnormal lateral rotational curves of the spine and kyphosis, an abnormal posterior deviation of the spine. The three major components of the spine are the spinal column, which is made up of the bones and discs, the neural elements, which is the spinal cord and the nerve roots, and the supporting structures, which are the muscles and ligaments. The intervertebral discs make up one-fourth of the spinal column's total length. And as you know, as we get older, they get smaller, so we kind of shrink in size. There are no discs between the atlas and the axis, C1 and C2, and the coccyx. The discs are made up of the annulus fibrous and the nucleus palposa. The discs are not vascular and therefore depend on the end plates of the bones to provide nutrients. In general, a typical spinal vertebra consists of a large vertebral body in the front, two strong bony areas called pedicles connecting the vertebral body and the posterior arch, and an arch of bony structures in the back called the spinous process, which is made up of the formation of the two lamina. The top two cervical vertebra are known as the atlas and the axis, or C1 and C2. 
These allow us to rotate and nod our head. The DENS of C2 actually fits into C1. This is very important in trauma because we look at the pre-dental space to see if there is any widening of that space which would indicate a fracture or dislocation. The neural elements consist of the spinal cord and the nerve roots. The spinal cord runs from the base of the brain down through the cervical and thoracic spine. Below the L1 and L2 level, the spinal cord ends an array of nerve roots continues called the quatrus equini. At each vertebral level of the spine, there are a pair of nerve roots. These nerves go to supply particular parts of the body. Let's discuss the supporting structures of the spine. They are the ligaments, the fascia, the muscles, and the nerves. The ligaments are rope-like bands of tissue that connect bones together. Most ligaments are lined up to keep joints from bending the wrong way. The most important ones, of course, are the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments. We use those a lot in evaluating trauma. If these ligaments are torn and there is a displacement, we know we have a fracture even though we cannot see the fracture. Fascia is similar to ligaments, but fascia is more like a sheet of thin rope. One of the most important of the fascia in the spinal column is the thoracal lumbar fascius. Muscles, because of their location towards the center of the body and because their importance in spine stability, these key stabilizers are called core paraspinal muscles. They are easy to discern on x-ray and for trauma again if you can see that there is a displacement of the paraspinal stripe you know even though you can't see the fracture in the thoracic area that you have a thoracic fracture. Finally look at the nerves. We have motor nerves and sensory nerves. Motor nerves signal the muscles to grip and hold and guide and control the spine. Sensory nerves transmit sensations such as heat, cold, touch, pressure, and pain. They also give us some of our sense of position. Because the sensory nerves transmit sensations, basically they are very important, especially when looking at a patient for back pain or trauma. If there is trauma or some other mechanism where the electromechanical conduction of energy becomes disrupted and ischemia becomes widespread, then spinal shock occurs. With the nerves and the neurons, if the electromechanical conduction becomes disrupted and ischemia becomes widespread, then spinal shock occurs. This swelling prevents the brain and brainstem to be able to transmit normally at or below the level of the injury. If the swelling is the only trauma, then when the swelling goes down, the sensations return. When we look at spinal cord trauma and disorders, we have a difference between being a paraplegic and a quadriplegic, and this depends upon where the injury actually occurs. Total paralysis, or quadriplegia, actually occurs in the upper cervical spine to the lower cervical spine, whereas paraplegia, where we still have some motion and sensation, occurs in the thoracic area and below. With trauma, we worry about the C4 level for injury because C4 are the nerves that control the phrenic nerves or our breathing. If you cannot breathe, you die. This is known as respiratory paralysis. Any disease process or injury that damages the spinal cord between the third and the fifth cervical segments may paralyze the phrenic nerves. The phrenic nerves are what move the diaphragm. Let's continue and look at spinal cord trauma and disorders, such as spinal shock, Lou Gehrig's disease, and poliomyelitis. Spinal shock, as we said earlier, may resolve, but it may take days, 
weeks or even months. A quadriplegic may be left with a baseline blood pressure lower than his or her previous normal pressure. This means that orthostatic hypotension may occur as a long-term problem. The deep tendon reflexes may return without conscious control or sensation. Spastic paralysis takes the place of flaccid paralysis. The key difference between flaccid and spastic paralysis is that in flaccid paralysis, muscles cannot contract and stay weak and floppy, while in spastic paralysis, muscles stay in contraction. Let's now take a look at a normal cervical spine. First, the dens and lateral mass distance should be less than 2 millimeters and symmetrical. The dens and arch of the uh, atlas distance, if it's less than 2 millimeters in adults and 4 millimeters in kids, is normal. Remember, children have more lax ligaments and therefore are more prone to problems such as dislocation of the occipital joint and trauma. If there is no trauma, we should be able to look at air going down the trachea. And above C4, the width is about half of the vertebral body width, and below C4, it's equal to about the width of one vertebra. With trauma, we get an idea of the location of the trauma, and if there is trauma, by the displacement of the prevertebral soft tissue. This is a subtle but very powerful indication of cervical spine trauma. Let's go on and take a look at the abnormal C-spine, which would include cervical spine trauma. One indicator would be unilateral facet dislocation, or half of the vertebral body shifted on the lateral view. If we have bilateral facet dislocation, half is shifted forwards. A widened interspinous gap is unstable. It indicates a crush fracture or a subluxation. It is suggestive of the rupture of the posterior cervical ligament and rupture and hematoma formation occurs. A severe flexion injury would be indicated by fractures in the anterior inferior margin of the vertebral body. If the traumatic force causes a severe extension injury, then the fractures will be anterior superior margin of the vertebral body. Now we'll take a look at the thoracic spine. And notice if you cannot get all of the cervical spine or the top of the thoracic spine on, we can use an alternative view called a swimmer's view to demonstrate both. For the APT spine, you want to see from C7 to L1 demonstrated with no rotation, the vertebral bodies well penetrated, and optimal exposure factors. For the lateral thoracic spine, you want to see from T1 to L1 demonstrated, the intervertebral disc spaces open, no rotation, and again, optimal exposure factors. So here we see a typical thoracic spine AP view. And now we take a look at a lateral thoracic spine and the criteria for judging it. You need to see all of the intervertebral foramina as well as the thoracic spine. The thoracic spine is the least likely area to get damaged from trauma unless the trauma is severe. Most of the images taken for the thoracic spine today will be done with a CT scan or an MRI. The thoracic vertebra 1 through 9 are pretty well protected by the rib cage and the thorax. If there is any area to look for of trauma, it would probably be the more transitional area, which would be 11 and 12. Because the level of trauma that it takes to actually damage the thoracic spine, you'll note that the spine fractures are rather easily determined by the physician. Sometimes, though, we might be able to tell if there's a fracture that we can't see by the movement of the paraspinal stripe. This movement indicates that there is a fracture because swelling is displacing the paraspinal stripe. 
The lumbar spine, like the thoracic spine, is usually seen now for diagnosis using CT or MRI. But if we do take plain films, we'll usually take an AP, a lateral, and an L5-S1 exposure. Lower back pain is the one that is most common to most folks. Usually we have lower back pain as we get older, or we have lower back pain as a result of injury, and also we have lower back pain from trauma. For many medical people, they'll find that they have lower back pain when they age due to all the wear and tear they put on their back over the years. Lower back pain is a common symptom of many different injuries and medical conditions. Common causes include such degenerative ch changes such as osteoarthritis, ankylosing spondylitis, spinal stenosis, herniated discs, pinched nerves, back pains, hand strains, and spinal fractures, growths like tumors, cysts, bone spurs, and spondylolisthesis. Wow, that's certainly a mouthful. Well, anyway, let's go through and take a look at these. Lumbar stenosis is a narrowing of the space around your spinal cord. This means there's less space for the nerves that branch off your spinal cord, and a tightened space can cause your spinal cord or nerves to become irritated, compressed, or pinched. Spondylolisthesis is a condition when a lumbar vertebra slips out of place relative to the vertebra below it, and this can cause pressure on a nerve which can cause lower back pain or leg pain. There can also be vertebral fractures. A fracture to the bones of your spine can result from compression, often from minor trauma in a person with osteoporosis, or it could be a burst fracture that is a vertebra that is crushed in all directions. A fracture dislocation, this mostly happens from motor vehicle accidents or falls from heights, or a result from your tumor on your spine. Next we'll look at sciatica. It's a nerve pain due to injury or irritation to your sciatic nerve which runs through your hips, buttocks, and down, each leg ending in your foot. The causes include herniated discs, spondylolisthesis, osteoarthritis, trauma to your spine or nerves, or a tumor in your spinal canal. The next area we're going to look at is herniated disc. A herniated disc is a compressed or torn or leaking vertebral disc, which is the cushion between each vertebra. A herniated disc can cause back pain, tingling or numbness in your legs, feet, or muscle weakness. And finally we'll take a look at the lower end of the spine itself and we can look at the quadra equinus. Cauda equinus syndrome. This condition is caused by the compression of the collection of nerve roots that look like a horse's tail called quadra equina that are about the level of L2 and this causes pain, weakness, and incontinence. Now the last part of the spine, the sacrum and the coccyx area. As we just saw, the sacrum and the coccyx are curved in the lateral position. So when we put the patient in the AP position, how do we elongate or use geometric distortion to show the sacrum and the coccyx, and how do we change techniques? There's certainly a big difference in the density and thickness of the two areas. Remember, we use geometric distortion, or angles, to flatten out that curve. Now we'll take a quick look at radiograph in spinal injuries, or trauma radiographs. Here we can see spinal injuries in different types of radiographs. Notice that the lateral C-spine shows about 80%, while a complete CT scan does 98%. As you can see, we have to be careful about how we actually do trauma patients and look at their spine. The most common reason for a missed spinal injury is a radiographic series that is technically inadequate. The incidence of vertebral column fracture is very low. This type of fracture only involves about 3 to 6% of all skeletal injuries. Tingling and numbness and loss of motion in the extremities are symptoms of a possible spinal cord injury. 
the more superior the symptoms, the closer the affected injury is to C1 and C2. Paralysis may be present on the patient's arrival in the emergency department. However, up to 30% of patients have a delayed onset of neurologic abnormalities, which may not occur until up to four or five days after the injury. Injuries of the cervical spine are the most serious injuries that can result from falls, industrial accidents, automobile accidents, and athletic activities. They cause a broad spectrum of disabling conditions, ranging from minor neck pain to quadriplegia and even death. The cervical vertebrae, although the smallest of all the spinal vertebrae, has the densest bone, more than any other part of the spinal column, and this helps us when we have trauma to the cervical spine area. Cervical spine injury is highly unlikely if the patient has no neck pain or tenderness, no neurologic signs or symptoms, and no loss of consciousness, and has a normal mental state and no distracting injury. For the fully conscious patient who is not able to cooperate so an adequate exam can be performed, it is best to keep the patient stable and perform the exam when they are able to cooperate. If there is a suspected cervical spine injury, flexion and extension views of the cervical spine should not be obtained until the entire cervical spine is otherwise cleared radiographically. Now let's review the thoracic spine once again and take a look at that paraspinal stripe. It may be difficult to see a fracture of the thoracic spine that is subtle, but by looking at the paraspinal stripe and knowing that when there is a fracture there is swelling in that area, in the displacement of the paraspinal stripe would give you a clue that there might be a fracture in that thoracic spine area. Another clue if there is fracture in the thoracic spine is to take a look at the pedicles. The CT clearly shows a fractured pedicle in both the AP and lateral or orthogonal views of the spine. Taking a look at the lumbar spine, you'll notice that it's close to the pelvis and pelvic injuries are the highest cause of death in trauma. A fractured pelvis can cause major arterial bleeding and the patient bleeds out. Remember the old Scotty dog? Well, the eye of the Scotty dog is the pedicle. And you'll notice here that they have a compression fracture and you can notice it by comparing the pedicles of the Scotty dogs above and below. This lateral plane radiograph of the lumbar spine demonstrates a lucency or a dark line at the pars interarticularis of L5 representing a spondylolysis. There is also a mild malalignment of L5 over S1. The L5 vertebra is slipping forward relative to the sacrum. Here is an enlarged spot view of the L5 S1 area. Say your patient comes into trauma and they have a fractured calcaneus. And if that is from a fall or jumping off a ladder, whatever, what we're doing is we're looking at a compression fracture. If there is enough force to fracture the calcaneus, you need to take an AP and lateral of the entire spine because you might have compression fractures along the spine as well. Also, in the lumbar spine, you want to take a look at the transverse processes of L2 or L3 or that area because that is the area where the ureters come down. And if those are fractured, you may have torn the ureter as well. Thanks for your attention. I hope you enjoyed finding a little bit about the spine and radiographing the spine or medical imaging the spine.